I shall begin. Um, because I've predicted uh, Trump's rise to power you know, far in advance, um, as Sarah noted, I've become, as one place called me, the Cassandra of Trump land, which is not a fun thing to be, by the way. I would have much rather been completely wrong and you know, had a mockery made of me and had world peace in the process. So if that trade comes around, I'll be happy to make it. Um, but because of this, I've, I've given a lot of talks, um, especially over the last month. And I've basically stopped preparing my talks too far in advance because every day has brought a series of unprecedented crises. I never know if during the time at, right before my talk whether the Trump administration will have, for example, fabricated new terror attacks, uh, whether the massacre in Bowling Green, Kentucky, or apparently there was uh, great unrest in Sweden uh, last night or whether he will have caused an actual humanitarian catastrophe, like stripping away US health care, rounding up immigrants and Muslims and threatening their civil, civil liberties on baseless grounds, defunding our schools, drilling our national parks, and forcing a rogue national park service to be created, uh, bringing white supremacists into the White House as new hires, engaging in various kleptocratic practices with a number of players, especially Russia, but you know other uh, potential uh, people involved, and you know those are just a few of the lowlights. If I were to name them all, you would you would be here all night, uh, perhaps for weeks. Um, as the cesspool of racism, corruption, nepotism, and utter disregard for our constitutional rights and liberties has been devouring my country. So, if you know during the time I started this presentation, Trump nuked North Korea or something, I guess we'll we'll take it during the Q and A. So, tomorrow marks one month since Trump was inaugurated. It's a month that has felt like a decade, not only because of actual policy changes, but because of the psychological shift that has taken place among Americans. For until this month, Trump was viewed with profound denial. American optimism blinded many to the vulnerabilities of the US to authoritarian rule. The motto of authoritarianism is famously, it can't happen here. Uh, and the modern corollary to that this election season is, Trump can't win. You heard this over and over again. We heard it during the primary, despite ample evidence that he could win, including a weak Republican slate, um, manipulation of the mass media, which had him round the clock on American TV uh, with many of his falsehoods uncontested, with his rallies aired uh, you know, nonstop, and his history of bullying and threats in order to control both media and political adversaries. We heard again he couldn't win in the general, even though once more there is evidence that things were in play. There was WikiLeaks selectively leaking documents on the Democratic Party, uh, the meddling of Russia, and most of all at this point, uh, the mainstreaming of extremism in which the fringes of political rhetoric and political policy were really pulled to the center. Uh, this was around the time when the masterful and cruel propagandist Steve Bannon was hired. And the media refused to investigate both his role um, and as well as Trump's history of corruption, as well as things like Russian meddling that could have predicted the outcome, um, sort of gliding along on the assumption that Hillary Clinton would win despite her own baggage and, and a contentious Democratic primary. All were part of willful blindness to our vulnerability to autocracy. And then he won. And then, of course, once he won, it was, OK, all right, he won. But we have checks and balances. We have the Constitution. We have people within our administration who aren't <clears throat> going to let him follow through on his anti-constitutional policies. Uh, this did not hold up. You know, what Americans, I think, have learned the hard way over the last month is that the Constitution is a piece of paper unless it's upheld. Checks and balances erode unless people are willing to stand by them. And that means contesting a very powerful and very corrupt uh, administration. And you have seen some, you know, pushback, which is great, um, in which I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later. Meanwhile, Trump has been building a cabinet that seems designed to dismantle the very institutions that it's supposed to uphold. And so what is the lesson here? Uh, along with people saying that Trump would win, there is also this hope that Trump would, quote, start acting presidential, uh, also known as the pivot. Everyone kept saying for a year that eventually Trump uh, would pivot, that he would change, uh, despite his 70 years of, of fairly continuous aggressive behavior. Uh, Trump did not pivot. Trump pivoted America to him. The goal of his campaign was to redefine norms so that later it would be easier to redefine laws. And that is what he is attempting to do right now. And so what are some of these norms that the Trump administration wants us to believe are the new American normal? 
Um, first, there's white supremacy as a dominant policy platform, uh, mo seen most recently in the Muslim ban and anti-Muslim rhetoric. Uh, kleptocracy based around Trump's family and this idea that the president is somehow above the law instead of representative of the law and bound to uphold the law. Uh, suppression of free speech by the public and the mainstreaming of hate speech as a sort of anti-political correct attitude and a telling it like it is. Even though there's been physical consequences for those speech, there's been you know bomb threats and beatings, uh, especially in the months leading up to election night uh, and in the weeks after. And so, uh, along with this, we also have an era in which there is very little transparency for government beyond the leaks that Trump so ve vehemently opposes, while there's total transparency of citizens uh, who are subject to slander, to doxing, and to harassment from above. And this is something that, unfortunately, I think may continue uh, more so as the months go on if the, the protests against him continue. Um, there's also been a reconception of the idea of the government uh, as providing public services. Uh, this idea seems to have been thrown out the window um, with tax dollars instead going to pay for things like Melania Trump to live in a golden tower or a giant vanity wall uh, put up against Mexico. And so now these are no longer hypothetical campaign promises. They are, practice, they are policies that are affecting our real life. And in some cases, they are not new. They are part of a long history of abusive power and systemic racism in the United States, a system of exploitation that relies on the willingness of the public to be both complacent and cruel. The U.S. has always been a flawed democracy. The U.S. was founded on stolen land, built by slaves, um, had a history of denying voting rights to all but white men for most of its existence. It's persecuted immigrants, uh, put put ethnic groups in internment camps, use the judicial system to target black and Hispanic citizens, ethnically profiled Muslims after 9-11, and that's just to name a few examples. So, you know, in a way, Trump is not novel, but kind of an ultimate culmination of, of a long uh, arc of history that we often tend to ignore. We've always had politicians who've flirted with making these precepts part of their platform, part of their identity, instead of cloaking them in the language of liberty or security. For example, in the era before the Civil War, um, the anti-immigrant, quote, know-nothing party, this is what they were actually called, uh, was on the rise with a philosophy that was very similar uh, to Trump's. And as an example of this, um, I want to read you a quote from Abraham Lincoln from 1855 that he wrote to his friend Joshua Speed. He wrote, our progress in degeneracy appears to be pretty rapid. As a nation, we begin by declaring all men are created equal. We now practically read it as all men are created equal except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, it will read all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. When it comes to this, I should prefer immigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty. To Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. So as you can see, unfortunately, that quote, which preceded the Civil War, holds up pretty well today. So as I was saying, in, in a sense, this is a continuation of the worst of U.S. politics, of systematic and structural abuses that better Americans, like Abraham Lincoln, have always opposed. But there still are some things that are distinct and new about the Trump administration, a level of danger which is truly unprecedented in its potential to unleash humanitarian consequences both in the U.S. and abroad. First, there's the matter of Donald Trump as a ostensible human being. Trump is basically like a magnet attracting the worst Americans. He's long posed as a success, but banked on his ability to pay off others uh, to market him as he's failed. He likely owes an, a large amount of money to people both in the U.S. and abroad, which makes him vulnerable um, and seems to have no problem abusing executive power to build kleptocratic wealth. He's also temperamentally unstable, to put it mildly, uh, and cruel and surrounded by people whose uh, motives often aren't, don't seem to be political in nature, but just cruelty for cruelty's sake, uh, like Steve Bannon. And he's working in, in tandem uh, with many around the world uh, who find, find his ego malleable. Trump is part, you know, as I'm sure you know here, of a broader right-wing, often white supremacist movement um, that's been rising throughout Europe and, and bringing extremists together. 
Um, on that note, the, the second uh, sort of unusual thing about Trump's campaign is that white supremacy and even neo-Nazism, neo-fascism has become the center of the platform, uh, which is something that we haven't seen in, in U.S. history in a mainstream political candidate. Um, some of the voters I've talked to that voted for Trump were able to overlook this, but for others, uh, this was Trump's primary appeal. And the Trump administration does not even really pretend to hide this. Their denials tend to be audacious lies meant to make citizens feel powerless, to feel as if there's no sense in speaking truth to power when power is the only truth. From what I gather, a uh, similar phenomenon is happening here in the Netherlands. And I'll uh, remark a bit on uh, Gert Wilders, who has also embraced anti-Muslim and xenophobic rhetoric sold under a guise of populism but with cruelty at its core. In the end, such politicians and policies tend to hurt everyone, including those who voted for the extremist candidate. We've seen this play out in Russia, in Poland, in Hungary, and in the UK after Brexit. As the most vulnerable citizens, generally ethnic and racial minorities, suffer, promises to those who put faith in the white nationalist candidates also tend to be broken, with only the candidate and his small group of backers profiting in the end. Finally, there's the unique time uh, in which we live, which uh, was alluded to in the video before. Um, I don't think Trump could have happened at another time. I think that Trump is a representative of the collapse of institutional norms and, and strength of institutions in the U.S. as much as he's caused them uh, to further diminish uh, in quality and strength. Um, you know, to, to go briefly over the last 15 years, um, you know, we've had the recession of 2008 from which much of the U.S., especially where I live in the heart of the U.S., never truly recovered. We had two wars um, which destabilized the entire Middle East, uh, causing repercussions, you know, for you in Europe as well as us in the United States. And we've had the rise of social media, which I don't think that any government has managed to keep pace with, which I think, you know, for all of the good uh, that it's caused, um, has caused political chaos and, and has proved uh, very ripe for manipulation by foreign actors. So, uh, as we are saying, I, I tend to be a bleak speaker, um, so I'll try to go out with uh, something a little more positive. Um, so, you know, you may be wondering, well, what can you do about this uh, unprecedented autocratic disaster? And so here's some advice. Um, my first tip is to keep expectations high. And so, you know, what do I mean by that? I don't mean you should keep your expectations high in the sense that you think that they will actually be responded to by the government, that the government will serve you, which is its, is its job, and that there'll be a satisfactory outcome. But you need to keep your expectations high in terms of you know, what you value, um, what you think is important, and what you expect uh, others to do. Um, you need to honor constitutional principles even if they don't, honor moral principles even if you don't, and refuse to let them change who you are and what you believe. Above all, stand up for others first. At times like this, the burden falls in an unprecedented way on citizens. And so unfortunately, it's up to citizens to be the representatives who failed them, to be the journalists who should have and didn't do a thorough investigation of these administrations, and to be the leaders uh, who are not coming through for us. These kinds of regimes can take away everything from you materially, but they can't take your conscience, they can't change who you are inside. Secondly, you're not alone in this. Uh, this is a shared burden, as we've seen from the protests uh, that have broken out worldwide. If we all do our part, uh, we can prevent a sort of social change. Um, you know, we can prevent a sort of shift of norms to the kind of extremism that Trump and his administration are, are selling. Um, and it, in the end, possibly affect political change. But I think the, the former is more important at this part. In the U.S. right now, there is massive resistance. Um, there is greater civil, civic resistance than I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, and that's because most people don't want this. There's this false idea that, that Trump has a mandate, including in places where I live, that, that did vote for him overwhelmingly. 
Um, but, you know, only about 25% of Americans did vote for him. Half of Americans didn't vote at all. Uh, I think we've learned that lesson the hard way. Um, and of those who did vote for him, many of them that I've spoken to are deeply alarmed uh, by the, the changes that are taking place, by the recklessness and the aggression uh, of his administration. And so they find people resisting everywhere. You find lawyers uh, coming as volunteers to the, to the airports to help immigrants. You find teachers fighting to keep schools funded. You find politicians and protesters uh, from all sides of the political spectrum working together, and ordinary citizens fighting back. And I do think, you know, for all my pessimism that there is strength uh, in these numbers. There is strength in this type of resistance. Um, you know, we've never had an administration this threatening to democratic values, but we've also never had such a forceful response in return. Um, and, you know, lastly, don't give up and don't give in. When you're met with a barrage of destructive policies put forth by men who might view you with contempt, it's very easy to become cynical or heartbroken or to feel like you have no choice but to accept this. There's a very American tendency to expect things to be okay, to want them to be okay, instead of to work for them to be okay for everyone. Um, and so on that note, I have uh, you know, some advice from American uh, traditions you may not be as familiar with. Um, there's American intellectual tradition that never shared this blind optimism because the myth of the American dream was never designed to apply to them. This is the black American intellectual tradition. And if you want to better understand both the US's history of white supremacy and earlier authoritarian policies on US soil, I suggest reading black American writers like James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, Frederick Douglass, who Donald Trump just discovered, um, Malcolm X, uh, and Martin Luther King. And I'm going to close this uh, presentation with a quote from Dr. King from a speech that he made one year before he was assassinated as it, it expresses the urgency of the moment and the threat at hand and the clarity of what we need to do uh, far better than I can. So this is uh, a quote from him. You may be 38 years old, as I happen to be, and one day some great opportunity stands before you and calls you to stand up for some great principle, some great issue, some great cause. And you refuse to do it because you are afraid. You refuse to do it because you want to live longer. You're afraid that you'll lose your job, or you're afraid that you'll be criticized and lose your popularity, or you're afraid that someone will stab you or shoot at you or bomb your house, so you refuse to take a stand. Well, you may go on and live until you're 90, but you're just as dead at 38 as you would be at 90. And the cessation, the cessation of breathing in your life is but the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. Thank you.